Well, my name is Corey Van Brokhoven. I'm the president of the Lidditz Historical Foundation, and we are so excited to have Adam Zern today from Uncharted Lancaster. This is a program that was actually almost a year in the making. He was originally scheduled to speak to our um, to a group of us in March at the Lidditz Public Library. That was uh, unfortunately eventually canceled because of COVID-19. But uh, as they say, you can't keep a good man down. So uh, we're happy to have him here on, on Zoom. And we're so excited to see, it looks like 59 people here so far. Welcome everyone. We have at least one person from the UK tuning in, which is amazing. Can, uh, just uh, great to see everyone. Hope everyone is well. In the chat, we have links to uh, Uncharted Lancaster, all of their social media pages, as well as the Lidditz Historical Foundation's social media pages. So after the program, please give them a follow. Uh, we really appreciate that. And if you have any questions for Adam, feel free to also type them in the chat, and then I'm sure he'll be happy to answer them at the end of the program. And without further ado, I'd like to present this uh, at this time, Adam Zern from Uncharted Lancaster. Take it away, Adam. Hey, thank you, Corey. Thank you for that kind introduction. I appreciate it. All right, well, welcome everyone. It is exciting to be here and to see all of you after trying to do this in March. And here we are finally in November and gonna make this thing a reality. My name again is Adam Zern and welcome to Ghost Stories and Tales of Adventure. I am coming to you live from Uncharted Lancaster World Headquarters, which may or may not be an unfinished corner here in my basement. So I know we've got some folks from the Lidditz Historical Foundation, and we've got some people from the Millersville Area Historical Society. We've even got uh, some Uncharted Lancaster fans, and I think my mother might be out there somewhere. Hey, Mom, how you doing? Uh, so I'd like to start just by saying, you know, what is Uncharted Lancaster? And that's a website that I run, and it has two sides. It One, we I, I kind of focus and highlight fascinating pieces of local history here in Lancaster County. I try and highlight things that people might be less aware of. So for example, did you know that on September 27th, 1777, Lancaster was the capital of the nation for one day? The Continental Congress fleeing Philadelphia from the invading British uh, headquartered there for one day and quickly decided that that was not far enough away from Philadelphia. And so they fled further west uh, across the river uh, to York where they spent the next nine uh, months. Now I'm looking and I see some heads nodding up and down. So some of you knew that. Excellent. Here's another one. Let's see if you knew this one. So Columbia. City of Columbia, formerly known as Wright's Ferry, named after John Wright, who I think you could make a good case as being Lancaster County's most influential founding father. Uh, but Columbia was nearly the nation's capital, missed it out by one vote. In September of 1789, uh, the House of Representatives meeting in New York voted to make the nation's capital somewhere in Pennsylvania. It then moved to the Senate and how little things changed, you know, all these years later. Uh, they couldn't come to agreement, mainly because the two senators from Pennsylvania couldn't get their act together. And we all kind of know how that story uh, pans out. And, you know, Washington is, in fact, the capital. But I like to think that in some parallel universe, uh, you know, Columbia, maybe Columbia, D.C., that might have been awkward, uh, you know, is the capital of the country, how that would have been so different. Now, opposite the history uh, of Uncharted Lancaster is the adventure side. And as an incentive to go and visit some of these historic places that I've talked about, uh, I've created these treasure hunts. And if you can decipher the clues and solve the riddles, then you can earn yourself some treasure and visit some of these historic sites that I, uh, I talk and write about. So I'd like to share with you my tale of adventure origin story, and we're going to learn a lot about Shanks Ferry here in the process. Uh, but really, it all comes down to this dog here. This here is Indiana Jones, and this is where you have to insert the obligatory Sean Connery impression. We named the dog Indiana. Uh, and in fact, we did. I have two dogs. That's Indiana Jones. And then we also have Turtle. And if you are a dog owner, you know that a good dog is a tired dog. Before this presentation, I took those guys on a three mile hike just to burn off some steam. So it was pretty common for the three of us to go walking pretty much every single day after school. 
and I live here in Conestoga Township, and we often would walk on the Enola Low Grade. Here's a photo from the other day. It's, uh, I like it a lot. Uh, a, in this stretch, not a lot of people. Two, it's flat enough and straight enough that I can read a book if I'm in the mood to do that. And so I'm having a conversation with some friends at work, and I mentioned we're talking about where we walk our dogs, and the one coworker says, hey, have you ever been to the cemetery there in Shanks Ferry? And I was like, uh, no, what? There's a, sh there's a cemetery? And he said, yeah, there's this old abandoned cemetery in the woods. You should go check it out. And so I did what anyone does when they have a question these days. You turn to Google. And I Googled it. And this was probably the first time in my entire life Google had no idea. And this, this becomes like a repeating theme for me with Uncharted Lancaster, how rarely the internet actually knows what it's talking about. Uh, there was no real firm location. And I did some searching and about the best that I could come up, of, come up with was this, this vague description, up a mountain, through a stream, across the railroad, until the cemetery appears in a small forested rise in Shanks Ferry. All right, well, it's not really uh, an exact map there, but I become determined that I am going to find this cemetery. I mean, how hard could it possibly be? Shanks Ferry is only 92 acres, right? So no problem. So the dogs and so I take take on this quest and we start uh, searching for this uh, lost cemetery. And so, and I'm thinking, all right, it's gotta be near a railroad. So it's either the Enola low grade or the port deposit and it's gotta be near a stream somewhere. So we start. Adam? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but did you change your screen off of your dog? Cause we're not seeing any oh. other thing. All right, let's, uh, let me stop the share and we'll go back. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. Nope, that's okay. Yeah, I can see it now. Uh, Shanks Ferry Wildlife Preserve. I'm seeing it on my screen. All right. How's that? Are we good now? Yes, I, I can see it at least. Origin yeah. story. Okay, I see some heads nodding up and down there. Great. Yeah, awesome. Sorry you. about that. Yes. Yep. So here's the, the vague description of where the cemetery lies. Uh, and hey, thanks. I appreciate that. If that happens again, just chime in and we'll, we'll get, get that fixed up. So there's the vague description of where this cemetery is. And so I'm like, no problem. I'm going to search Shanks Ferry. It's only 92 acres. How hard can it be? And so every day after school, the dogs and I, you know, kind of take a section of this thing and we, we start searching. And while I don't immediately find the, the cemetery, I do find a lot of neat and interesting things along the way. When I'm not searching physically in Shanks Ferry, I'm doing a lot of searching online. And I find an old lime furnace. I find a a spooky tunnel. I find some random train hardware in the woods. I find these long dark culverts that you can explore. I find this mysterious stone pillar in the, you know, the middle of a stream somewhere. And the thing that definitely gets my attention most is this plaque to the site of a dynamite factory explosion. I mean, when was the last time you're out in the woods and you find a, uh, a plaque in the middle of nowhere commemorating a dynamite factory explosion? And this, this is just an amazing tale here. So this here is a photo of the dynamite factory. And this is in Shanks Ferry in an area called Bosman Hollow. And this factory was put there because they were producing dynamite for the nearby Enola Low Grade. And the Enola Low Grade, as I mentioned, I walk there a lot and it is flat. It is no more than a 1% increase or decrease in elevation along the entire way and no more than a 3% turn along the entire route. And so whenever they came to a hill or a mountain, that just meant we are just going to, you know, channel our way through it. And if there's a valley, no problem. We're just going to fill it in. I can't imagine them doing that today with environmental laws the way they are. Uh, and just to give you an idea, this is between 1903 and 1906. In today's dollar, the Enola Low Grade project would cost close to half a billion dollars. My great grandfather said that was back in the day when the railroad had more money to, than it knew what to do with. Now, obviously a project like this is going to take literally thousands of tons of dynamite to do all this blasting and all this expl uh, and all this demolition work. In fact, uh, there was so much blasting, 200 men died building the Enola Low Grade, whether it was dynamite explosions or debris flying from dynamite explosions, all of those things. Another common practice was with a dynamite factory like this, A, you would build it kind of away from things. You wouldn't want to put it in downtown Lancaster in the city in case there was an explosion. And the common practice was you would build 
a new dynamite factory every one to two years. All these explosive powders would settle in the floor, in the wood, work uh, on the walls, and just prime it for a possible premature accidental explosion. I mean, something theoretically as simple as a static shock could, you know, set this off if there's a lot of explosive powders there. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened on June 9th, 1906, at exactly 1242 p.m. 2,500 pounds. suddenly exploded. So that first photo was about a month before the explosion. And here's a photo from the day after. A pressure wave goes flying out. And people as far away as one and a half miles report plates being knocked off of counters, windows being cracked and shattered, and even barns being dislodged from their foundations. Further away, as far as 15 miles away, people report hearing the massive explosion. A lot of people were sure that it had to be uh, an earthquake. But of course, the worst disaster was right there at the epicenter. And the newspapers at the time had these grisly uh, headlines with gruesome details inside of it of these men uh, being blown apart and basically vaporized. There was a, one quote in a newspaper, uh, one of the, and I'll give it air quotes, rescue workers uh, talked about picking up the body parts and compared it to chestnut picking, which was about the size of the pieces uh, that they were finding. All in 11 men were killed nine more injured and this is a, a photo there and I was able to colorize uh, as many that were in the photo and identifiable at, at the time. About three days later they had a large funeral at uh, Colemanville United Methodist Church it's about two miles away from the site of the explosion. Uh, Ten of the eleven men were basically buried in uh, a box and that's because that's all the body parts they found. Uh, Ten of the eleven were completely unidentifiable. Uh, one man by the last name of Rice was buried in his own grave. Uh, he had a scar on his arm and they were able to identify him. You know since I originally published the article I've had a few people reach out to me over the years. Uh, one woman said her great grandmother's brother died in the explosion and they knew it was him because they found some scalp and it had red hair on it and her uh, and this man was the only one on the work crew who uh, had uh, red hair at the time. Now mm -hmm. not to get oh are we okay? I heard a voice. Okay. Uh, not I to said get wow. To, well, yeah wow it's pretty crazy isn't it? Just just tragic. Now, not to get discouraged or uh, off the line of my uh, main quest there, I did eventually find this Benedict Eshelman Cemetery there in the woods after like weeks and months of searching. Now, this belonged to Benedict Eshelman. And in on June 5th, 1727, he purchased 600 acres in what would eventually become uh, Conestoga Township. He was the first to build a dwelling here. And again, what would have become eventually become Conestoga Township. It, it wasn't at that time. The cemetery contains 27 marked graves. There's a lot more there that are either, you know, you can't read them or it's just really a stone stuck there. The oldest grave that you can read uh, is 1780. And the youngest, I find this pretty interesting, dates back to 1928. So even though it's in the middle of the forest there, kind of gives you an idea that, you know, less than 100 years ago, there were definitely lots of people that here and not just uh, forest. As you can see in the photo, depending on the size of the screen you're looking at, uh, a majority of them are in German, kind of, again, representing the people uh, that were here. And you can see, like, in the bottom uh, there, almost bottom right-hand corner, it's just a stone. There's really nothing on it. My guess is there are stones there that are older than 1780, especially given the mortality rate of children and such at the time. And my guess is there's probably, again, some younger ones there. My favorite tombstone is this, and it says, remember me as you, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. Remember me when this you see, as I am now, so you will be. And it's kind of a, a grim reminder of, of where we're all headed there from John Eshelman in October 28. And so, you know, I had a, a neat experience doing this, like going out, finding the cemetery, learning about this, you know, decimated dynamite factory, finding these culverts and stone pillars and all these other neat 
places and artifacts in Shanks Ferry, learning about its history that I thought, you know, I think other people would enjoy having a similar adventure, probably not over the course of weeks or months, but maybe over the course of a Saturday afternoon. And this idea for, you know, this treasure portion, this adventure side of Uncharted Lancaster uh, was born. There's probably some of you have probably been on at least some version of this uh, adventure out there. Now, it should come as no surprise that an area with such rich history would also have its fair share of ghost stories. Now, most seem to center on the tunnel at Shanks Ferry and involve a ghostly woman dressed in white. Now, there's a couple variations of this story, but one is a secretly pregnant bride was left at the altar by a reluctant groom. And in her you know, grief and then soon to be public shame, she hung herself there in the, on, from the arch of the tunnel. There's another version of the story in which she didn't commit suicide, but instead was murdered. And in this version, her uh, reluctant uh, groom does in fact marry her, but has too much to drink at the reception and the two uh, newlyweds end up in an argument on their way home and he's and she's murdered there in the tunnel. And then the there's the third version of the story and, and it's not she's not the one that died, but her husband, whether it's an accident, uh, some kind of carriage accident or a robbery gone wrong, but either way, her new husband dies here or is murdered here in the tunnel and her spirit forever lurks there mourning his death. Now, regardless of the version that you buy into, summoning her ghost is easy. You drive your car to Shanks Ferry and you park it there in the center of the tunnel. Of course, the closer to midnight, the better. Turn your car off, you get out, you place the car keys on the roof and you walk around the car three times, at which point you get back into the vehicle and you wait there in silence in the dark. And if you've done the ceremony correctly, and if the energy's right, her ghost will appear. Of course, keep in mind, she's not always happy to have visitors. Now, of course, if you see your ghost, you want to hightail it out of there, whether you're going to run on foot or by your car, but either way, you want to get out of there. Now, what I thought was interesting is that after I published that article last year, I had a retired Conrail locomotive uh, engineer reach out to me, and he told me that, you know, no one died in the tunnel, but this is what really happened, that in 1974, uh, a woman was hit by a train there. And you got to keep in mind, the Nola low grade ran until 1989, and apparently, uh, the, she was dressed in a white sheet and she was supposedly like an escaped, you know, inmate from a uh, psychiatric hospital in Maryland. And that accident took place directly above the tunnel. And he said that the, the railroad kept that pretty hush hush and out of the news that that happened. But there was no murder inside or death inside the tunnel. But instead, it was above the tunnel, which I thought was uh, kind of an interesting piece. Now, of course, not all stories center on any kind of ghost in white. Uh, and so I found this story and I, I thought this was pretty interesting. And this is, we're gonna come back around to this a little later, but these two students from Millersville, college students, go down to the tunnel and they park the car and they do their, you know, the, the little ceremony. They walk around the vehicle three times and they're sitting in their car in silence. And, you know, the, this ghost of a woman doesn't appear. Instead, this emaciated figure with long arms and long legs suddenly just kind of walks in front 
of the tunnel and he's at about halfway it stops and just kind of looks at the car and eyeballs it for a few moments and then walks away and they of course hightail it out of there because they thought that was pretty weird in their version of the story they kind of described a bit like golem but again this emaciated figure with longer arms and longer legs and so i think that's interesting we're going to kind of swing back around to that uh, a little later now, one of the questions I get from folks a lot is, why is there this ginormous tunnel in the middle of Shanks Ferry? I mean, it is, if you've been there, it is more or less in the yeah. middle of nowhere. And what people forget is, you know, there was a huge community down there. The area was originally founded by Henry Shanks, and he ran a ferry between the York County side and uh, in Lancaster here. And you can see uh, some that's not Henry Shanks, but that's you know from the exact same time period, uh, a little further south there on the Susquehanna, but ran a ferry back and forth. Uh, you can see there, there's his hotel. He had a hotel. And I, this picture is pretty neat because you can see the tunnel in the background. And then above it, you can see uh, a train there. And there's a couple interesting things here. A, if you take a look, there's almost no train trees are very few trees in this photo. So at this point, you know, most of the trees were gone and, and mostly like cattle grazing, but there was a big community. There was this hotel. There was another hotel further down. Uh, there was a school, a uh, post office, a railroad station, uh, lots of residential homes. Uh, later, there was some ironworks. There was a narrow gauge railroad that kind of ran up Grubbs Run, where if you walk in there, it's kind of that, that wildflower trail today. Uh, later, there was a coal dredging operation there. So this was a, this was a busy area. And so, you know, the, there's a big tunnel for people to uh, get down there. A road also ran along the railroad, the port deposit line to Peckway. And that would have been an easy way to get down to Peckway. You just come down through here and then, you know, a relatively level uh, drive through as opposed to driving up and down those steep hills that you do now if you go by uh, car. Uh, but we often forget that, you know, you know, Henry Shanks and, and others, uh, definitely not the first people uh, to come to this area. There were obviously Native Americans and, and probably the most famous being our Conestoga Indians who were, you know, massacred there at the old Lancaster County Prison, which is now the um, the Fulton Theater. And before that, they were called, you know, the Susquehannocks. And uh, John Smith wrote about them meeting these giants. And, you know, were they actually giants? Well, probably not by our standards today, but John Smith being a European at the time was about five and a half feet tall. And, you know, and the Susquehannocks were tall, likely six feet and eating a high protein diet as opposed to these sailors on some, you know, awful, you know, naval, you know, diet there, you know, these guys would have definitely looked like giants to them. But what people often forget is that the Susquehannocks were really relatively new to the area, uh, hadn't been here long before the arrival of John Smith. And before that, there were the Algonquin and while they were like a prehistoric uh, group, I mean, they don't have any, you know, written language and, and left few reminders, they did uh, most likely put in these petroglyphs, which are a very short distance away from Shanks Ferry. If you stand on the shore and you know where to look, you can see the islands of where they are. And so again, on this map, I've got Shanks Ferries uh, highlighted in the bottom right hand corner. And this was another great example of the internet having no idea what it's talking about. Uh, in doing all this research about Shanks Ferry, I repeatedly read about these petroglyphs and I really wanted to, to visit them. And so easy enough, Google has Indian Rock Island on the map, no problem. I get in my kayak at Safe Harbor and I paddle out to the island and guess what? There are no petroglyphs there, not even close. And it was on a, a later trip after doing some more exploring that I was able to find it. But again, they're, they're, you know, they, their location is not you know, readily or correctly identified there on the internet. Here's a photo that I took from the dam at Safe Harbor with a telephoto lens and you can see big Indian rock and little Indian rock. Now here in this photo, they look like they are really, really close together. They're not. That telephoto lens is doing some distortion. It's probably closer to 100 yards between the two. But there are two guys there uh, standing on Little Indian Rock, which is harder to find because it's significantly smaller. But it does have a larger um, concentration of petroglyphs. And if you take a kayak or a canoe out there, you can visit these petroglyphs, which is pretty neat. And you take a sponge with you, and you uh, take a wet sponge, and you wipe it over the petroglyph and it reveals itself, which is which is really, really neat. Now, again, you've got to keep in mind that this uh, this is 
being done by a group of people that have no language, no written language. I mean, they can talk to each other, obviously, but no, no written language. It's used, you know, all stone tools at this point. Uh, there are no iron tools. They didn't get any of that until European settlers uh, came. And the rocks out here on the river are you know, basically things that these Native Americans saw every single day. And so here we are on little Indian Rock Island and I have like kind of a, a, a image there, a visual image and then the actual petroglyph. So, you know, lots of animal tracks. In this case, we've got a bear. Uh, this one's a little easier to see, a turkey. And so there are turkey tracks all over the, uh, the rock. And so again, this is something that Indians, the Native Americans would have seen all the time. Uh, deer, deer prints, and I think the deer prints are really neat because it's almost as if a deer had walked across that rock when it was like soft mud or or something because they are that realistic in in appearance. Those are those are really cool. There are um, these either snakes or riverbanks. I like to kind of think of this as, as, you know, like maybe the Susquehanna and there's the two banks with uh, the river kind of flowing in between them, but it, it could be snakes, no one's, sh uh, you know, sure. Uh, but what I, what's really cool, and if you think that, uh, you know, maybe this is just sort of Native American teenager graffiti with nothing better to do. I mean, what do you do all day if you don't have video games and TikTok? Maybe you get a rock and you, you know, you make carvings on a, on a big stone. But just to give you an idea that that is not the case, um, the Equinox Sunrise lines up perfectly between those two riverbanks, which I find, you know, really, really cool. Then there's another one uh, that lines up here. There's a riverbank or a snake. And I like to think of this as maybe it's a smaller stream. So you've got like maybe the Susquehanna with the two lines that are that are large. And then you've got this uh, smaller one. So maybe this representing the, you know, the Conestoga uh, possibly, which is really close by. But this one, the winter solstice sunrise lines up with it. And then on the summer solstice sunset, it lines up. And so these are definitely not just haphazard things, but this is, you know, a very purposeful uh, thing and something that people, this obviously meant a lot to them. Now, the easier one of the two to find is Big Indian Rock. I mean, here is a, another telephoto picture that I took, this one from the rail trail through some trees. And it's, it's pretty tall out of the water. You can see it. And at least currently, it's pretty easy to find because there are two giant logs laying across it. Um, no, no guarantee that it'll be there if you ever go. I, I could see another flood washing those away. But you can even see it on Google Map there, and I've kind of got it highlighted in the picture. Uh, this one has far fewer Native American um, petroglyphs. There's there's some cool, like there's some newer ones in the sense that there's a, a piece stuff from 1880, which is very beautiful, uh, but definitely some graffiti, but still, you know, pretty old by our standards. Uh, and here is a man in a canoe, and you can see the little canoe there, and he's he's in it. But what I find fascinating in is this next one here. And so these Native Americans, most likely the Algonquin, and again, there's no firm understanding exactly when they were made, but most, most experts think that they're at least a thousand years old and that these petroglyphs represent the most significant archeological site in Pennsylvania, possibly the Northeast United States. I mean, there were more in the Susquehanna, but with the construction of the Safe Harbor Dam, uh, the other ones, most of them are at least underwater. Uh, there are some other places, but you know, this is a significant archaeological site and it's right here. And I always enjoy going out because if I stand there on the rock, and especially if I look towards the York County side, which is pretty much all trees, I can kind of get an idea of what it must have been like, you know, to stand in that very spot where, you know, our ancestors did a thousand years ago. But what I find interesting about this one, up until this point, everything that I've shown you are things that the Native Americans are seen. Indians, you know, snakes or rivers, you know, people in a canoe, and then suddenly they draw this thing. And so what is it? And there is an Algonquin legend of the Wendigo, and this is a man-eating creature. And here is sort of a picture of what it might look like. Uh, some think it's perhaps a, a distant relative of Bigfoot. Others think some kind of werewolf uh, or like a deer with uh, uh, antlers on it. But all of the stories say that it is a creature, this emaciated looking creature with long arms and long legs and typically hunts uh, in the colder times of the year. And, it, and what it hunts is people. And I thought that was pretty interesting with that tunnel story. There's those, these two guys. And again, they're, they don't see that white angel. Uh, instead, they see this emaciated creature with long arms and makes me wonder, did they see a Wendigo that the Native Americans had talked about 
all these years ago. And there's some artistic renderings from these Algonquin legends there. Well, hey, I want to thank you folks for being here today, and it is a beautiful day out. So something that I would like to encourage you to do is go explore your backyard. Uh, COVID is definitely uh, not any fun, and it's really put the kibosh on most travel. But, you know, we, we have this exciting opportunity, especially on days like this when it's beautiful out, that we can go out and, you know, we can explore our own backyards. And if I hadn't gone on this crazy wild goose chase to look for a wild, to look for this lost cemetery, I would never have, you know, Uncharted Lancaster would never have happened. Uh, and I would never have realized just all the neat history that's out there and all the neat things there are to experience just here in our backyard. So my big advice to everyone is just go out and, and explore. Lancaster Conservancy has uh, wonderful properties that you can explore. We've got some exciting state game lands and some other historic sites that are definitely worth uh, exploring and, and visiting there. And I'll stop there, and if anyone has questions, I can take a look at the uh, the chat window and see if I missed anything. But uh, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming, and I appreciate you giving me your time this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Adam. Uh, yeah, I do see one question from a Sarah uh, Rosengrant. She says, how do I get to the cemetery? All right, so funny story with that. Uh, so that was the first adventure. And what I didn't know at the time is that cemetery is on private property. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so um, I didn't know that. And, and I don't you know, typically encourage pr uh, trespassing. So they let me know and I um, detour and I, I kind of change that adventure so you don't go to the cemetery but if you do if you do go and google it now it shows up on some of those cemetery websites and they have like the gps coordinates of it but it's outside of the boundaries of, of shanks ferry there uh, a bit but it is on private property unfortunately so so i'll kind of leave uh, it at that so that was my bad yeah. uh doing that and i try really hard not to encourage <laughs> trespassing uh julie fisher says i would love for you to offer this again in the future um do you want to talk about Adam? Uh, you, we talked about having this recorded. Yeah, so it is recording. So I don't know how long it'll take. It says it takes usually twice as long as the presentation lasts. But uh, Corey was going to get that posted on their YouTube channel. So I would imagine in a few days at the most, we you should see it show up, and and I'm sure I'll share it on on uh, the Uncharted Lancaster social media site as well. Yeah, yeah. So just to. Piggyback on when Adam said, yes, we're going to post it to our YouTube channel. If you go to youtube.com and then search Lit It's Historical Foundation, uh, we probably have 50, 75 videos up there already. Some actually uh, former programs that we had at the Lit It's Library. So you can look uh, at old programs that we hosted many, many years ago. Um, does anybody have any other questions for Adam? Um, if you want to, okay, here, here we go. Uh, Julie Elizabeth Boyd says, is there any other landmass under those Indian rocks? I think she means um, a, a big, big Indian and little Indian rock that, with the petroglyphs. Um, are there others or is there more, more land? Go ahead, if you want to, Julie, if you want to unmute, you're welcome to, if you want to clarify there just a little bit. I'm looking at the question here on my other screen. She says right. under the water. Oh, yeah. under the water. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I've, I keep trying to get out there. If you pay attention to the like safe Harbor, uh, what is it's, um, Brookfield is the website, the company that owns them. And also the Conestoga river club posts a lot of it, but, uh, I meant to get out there. I think it was two weeks ago. They had, uh, drained the water about four feet lower than normal. And I had really wanted to get out there because a lot more of little Indian rock and, and big Indian rock would be visible than, than normal. Um, it, it, there's definitely, you know, it's one thing to walk down a trail. Visiting those petroglyphs is another. I mean, there's a couple of things. I, I, that's not something I would do in the winter or if the water's cold. Uh, I don't do it if there's been a heavy rain. You know, I'm looking for like late summer is great. It's getting to be, the water's getting to be cold now. But when we haven't had a lot of water, that's a good time to go out because, you know, when I do it, I, I put in it safe harbor and I, I kind of head towards what Google calls, you know, big Indian Rock Island, I kind of hug the shore and that'll almost drop you off at the petroglyphs. 
Um, but if, you know, th that can be some turbulent water coming out of the dam, depending on, on what they're doing. So I always just kind of check their website and see if they're releasing or plan to release any water or if we've had a heavy rain, I don't go out there. Uh, I mean, people die every year on the, on the Susquehanna. Typically there's alcohol involved and they're not wearing a life jacket and the water is cold. It's typically some combination of those things. Um, but there, supposedly there is more. Uh, there was a Walnut Island, which would have been up by, near uh, Washington Borough, and that's flooded uh, because of the dam, and so there's one there. You can go, not right now, but the Conestoga Historical Society has four of the petroglyphs, I believe, from, uh, from some of the rocks that were going to be flooded that they have on display, and I believe there's a couple at the State Museum in Harrisburg you can go and see, too, if you're not, you know, if, if you don't feel like braving the elements to go out there and see it yourself, so that's, that's a neat thing, but I, it is, it is just this amazing moment that you're thinking, wow, like a thousand years ago, people stood in this very spot. And again, when I look west towards York and I, I think I'm seeing what they saw a thousand years ago and, and just that's a kind of a magical thing, I think. Uh, another question, um, what's, uh, Adam, do you uh, recommend a good GPS so they don't have to use their phone? Uh, that's a good, <laughs> um, I don't, I usually use my phone when I can. Um, it's getting to be better now that the leaves are off the trees. Like you can actually get some reception in there. I know some people and I do too struggle. There is just zero reception in some parts of, of Shanks Ferry in the summer of all that, that leaf mm -hmm. coverage. Um, I don't, I keep kicking around the idea of having an app where you wouldn't need any like data and it would just kind of pull your GPS and kind of give you that stuff. But I just need more hours in the day to make those type of things a reality. I think I saw another question. Yeah, here's another question from Michael Link. Are we allowed to go to the tunnel at night? Um, that's a good question. I, I know Shanks Ferry, or so the, all the conservancy properties close at, at dusk. Um, so, so technically no, but I, I mean, where the tunnel is, that's still Conestoga Township. So I, uh, I don't see any either. signs as I don't be there at night. So you'd okay, probably, so, be, uh, probably be all right. Uh, along also, that Conestoga line. Township has no police, <laughs> police force right now. So you would probably be okay too. <laughs> uh, so, uh, kind of along that same line, somebody also asked, how many tunnels and culverts are accessible in Shanks Ferry? Uh, they said they think they've only found two. Two. Okay, so great question. There are four between the dam and um, I guess five. If you, so if you count counting the, the tunnel you drive through in Shanks Ferry and then, and then going north towards Safe Harbor, there are four that you can go through. Um, if any of you have done the Tunnels of Enola adventure, that kind of you know, takes you, zigzags you through those four. There's a smaller one and there's some I had some a few pictures of it there uh, of the culvert that you if you take the, like the wildflower trail in Shanks Ferry you can walk through that one and you can walk through it and, and I don't know you can get about maybe 30 feet on the other side before you hit private property but you know the the township owns and typically 30 feet I'm trying to show that on the screen 30 feet on either side of the rail trail and in some areas there are even more um, if you keep going there's uh, another one there on the there's two more um, after that one there's one kind of between Shanks Ferry and the Colemanville United Methodist Church and then another one pretty close to uh, the Colemanville United Methodist Church, but it's getting to be the time of year where, and I did a lot of these in the winter, I just take a chunk of rope and I tie it to a post and the, the all the pickers and everything are down and I just kind of repel down the side a little bit and check out all these tunnels because they're all on, you know, wherever you are, they're on the township property. So they should be, you know, accessible to check out. And I've been slowly kind of documenting them, but I would say between, you know, Shanks Ferry and, and Safe Harbor, there's six, I guess you could say there's six. All right, another question. It's more of a hypothetical question from Greg Engelhart. Uh, he asks, with everything that happened in Shanks Ferry in the town history, why wasn't this taught in school for local history, at least when he went there? That's a good question. I, I don't know. My my brother-in-law teaches local history at uh, LS, and I, and I know he, I don't think he can includes a lot of Shanks Ferry, but I see my website getting hit from his uh, from his blog page and Schoology page. So I think there's a little more of it there. I don't, uh, you know, you know, I don't know. It's amazing how much of it isn't documented in any kind of like single 
location. I mean, I had to do, I love the, I have a Lancaster newspaper membership and I spent a lot of time in their digital archives because you can do a word search and a date search and, and, and find these things. And I mean, I'll be honest, I searched and as far as I could tell, there was no deaths or suicide at that Shanks Ferry tunnel. I don't want, sorry to put the kibosh on that ghost story, everybody, but you know, I couldn't find anything that it puts that in there, but yeah, you know, I don't know. We typically <laughs> focus on what World War One, World War Two, the big ones there, and then that's about it. But you know, that's why I like bringing that stuff to light. That you know, people can go and visit that and, and learn about those things. Any other questions? Any other questions for Adam? Oh, here we go. Uh, uh, the state police are down there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is true. I was at uh, Silver Mine. We were doing a Cub Scout thing, and it ran a little long, and it got dark. And Peckway, <laughs> Peckway Police Force stopped by. Luckily, we were Cub Scouts and on our way out. So Someone says next time you should talk about the weird cellar with the rest with the nesting buzzard. Oh yeah, that's a good one. You can see that on the tunnels of Anola. Uh, I, I've had a couple people, some people think maybe it was um, like, like a spring house. There's definitely like a trough there, maybe some water where you could put those big jugs of, of milk in and you would cool it. Um, but yeah, I, some people went in there and there was a turkey buster, turkey buzzard nesting in there. And I didn't know that they nested on the ground like that, but that would, that, yeah, that was a wake up when you hiked up in there and this giant turkey buzzard would come flying out and scare the poop out of you, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Any other questions for Adam? Well, if you think of a question after we uh, all log off here, feel free to reach out to him on his website. And I also recently posted both of our organization's uh, websites as well as social media channels. If you wanna give all of them a follow, we would all appreciate it. And um, I think that's it. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you everyone for joining us here on this special Zoom presentation. Hope everyone is well and healthy and um, thanks again. Have a great day. Hey, thank you. Happy adventuring, everyone. I'll talk to you later. Thank you.